Hey guys, David here. Welcome back to the DGR podcast. This is episode 100. We made it to the big 100, uh, which is pretty cool. So I was about to say congratulations to you uh, there, but I guess that doesn't make sense. But congrats to all of us. If you have been with us since the beginning or for a long time now, uh, thank you so much for listening and showing your support along the way. Whether you're someone who uh, shares stuff lets us know, gives us feedback or not. I do appreciate you listening. And um, hopefully the podcast has been informative for you. Hopefully it has been enjoyable, which is really important to me. Um, hopefully it has been, hel- has helped you with your career or with your clients or with your own body or hopefully all of those things. Hopefully it's helped you navigate the industry a little bit better or maybe the business side of things a little bit better. Hopefully it has been fun for you. Um, It's made you laugh. Maybe it's made you frustrated at times with me or one of my guests, but all of that is normal. And I think podcasting is uh, quite an intimate experience, actually. You You put a podcast, you put someone into your ears for an hour a week, maybe, or whatever it is. Over the course of like 100 episodes, that's 100 hours of listening to someone talk. So you genuinely do, I think you guys probably do get to know me pretty well you know my good parts and my bad parts probably all too well (laughs) better than I do you know I don't know you probably know you probably know me pretty well at this stage I would say and I think that's cool to be honest I think that's cool um so yeah hopefully it's been a fun ride for you guys as well I can't say it's always been fun for me it's been there's been times when I've been frustrated with the podcast not like super frustrated but more like uh, demotivated by it I suppose but I tried to let me just close these blinds it's shining in on me one sec uh that's better uh and this one so yeah when I started out I, I I delayed starting the podcast for quite a while before I actually started it because I wanted it to be I didn't want it to be a headache I really didn't want it to be a headache I wanted it to be this is this is like relatively smooth sailing here and um it has been that I didn't want to have to edit I didn't want to have to uh, worry about editing or finding someone to edit I wanted it to be just I'll sit down and talk maybe I'll have a guest and we'll go from there as time has gone on I've had I've done more and more solo episodes just sometimes logistically it's just easier for me to just sit down and talk about something and other times it can be difficult to find the person that you want to talk to something about uh, or about something because um, I just have a particular set of views and um, yes I I guess maybe maybe I should branch out a little bit more but sometimes it's just nice to just literally sit down and just talk Um, so yeah that's the podcast uh, 100 episodes so what has happened since the last and one thing I will say I got a message or I got some of you might have seen it on my stories a guy tagged me on my stories uh it was yesterday uh he was fasting he put up a video in his car of listening to the podcast and I was talking about our homemade pizza and I just and like that was that was difficult for him I'm sure but I, I that was hilarious to me that actually made my day but not necessarily just because it was a funny video but it was I can't think of your name right now so apologies um but shout out to that person um but it was funny to me and it was really cool to me because in it he said when you're listening to your mentor talking about our our mentor his the podcast or whatever so I guess some of you guys that I guys and girls when I say again when I say guys I mean both or whatever if you identify as a microwave that's fine too but I um I guess some of you probably view me as a mentor, maybe, like this person did, and I had never met this person. So um yeah, I think that's that's cool. I'm not I'm not saying I am your mentor or anything. I'm not trying to um I'm not uh, arrogant enough to say something like that, but maybe you view me in your mind as being uh, a mentor to you or maybe not either way that's cool but some of you do and that is pretty cool uh that's what something like a podcast allows you to do is to have a hopefully a very strong positive impact on someone's life without actually ever 
having a conversation with them. So that's the good part of social media and podcasting and the world that we live in uh, today. So big news, we I'm now a dad and Kira is now a mom to, we had a little boy, Matthew, uh, last week, I think he's about eight days old now, I think, yeah, I think this is his eighth day. Um, it was, uh, everyone is doing really well, uh, he's doing really well, Kira is doing really well, Kira is actually doing unbelievably well, so, like, I don't know, her belly just, the, the, is that what you call it? The belly? It just started to like shrink really, really fast. And I really, I've, I've just noticed it every single day, which I guess happens when you give birth to a child, like thing, it starts to shrink, but it's a testament to her, how fit she stayed during the pregnancy that even today, like eight days later, I was looking at her. I was like, I can barely actually see any difference between you now and the way you were uh, before you got pregnant. So um, I'm not saying that is every a uh, woman's journey or anything everyone's going to be different some so <laughs> i know some women here will be listening and that that might be upsetting to them what i just said so i, I don't mean it in that way um or that might be cuz cuz your journey might have been different your birth might have been harder or whatever but i'm just it's literally it's not to take away from anyone else it's just a hat tip to kira that um i think she did really well and our doctor did say um from the beginning he said giving he said uh labor is for fit people um and i thought that was a really cool thing and a really important thing for him to say to us from the beginning uh labor is for fit people and uh recovery after obviously giving birth is so much easier just like like let we can't, let's not sugarcoat it like just like rehabilitation post-op or something like that the better shape you are going into it the better shape you will be coming out of it um even if it doesn't go to plan being strong and healthy um is going to help you even if it doesn't go to plan actually even more so i would say if it doesn't go to plan being strong and healthy is is even more important then so um women are incredible absolutely unbelievable what I saw in that treatment room or that uh, labor ward, I tried my best not to see anything. I tried to stay up by the head, uh, but you catch a couple of accidental glimpses along the way. And um, a friend of mine, this is not what I said, but a friend of mine said, it's like watching your favorite pub burn to the ground. <laughs> so I'm not saying that, but that, I thought that was a funny one. So um so yeah, that was, uh, that was the labor, but the midwives, the nurses were absolutely unbelievable and everyone does say that but they were so 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 good and um i have a couple of little just i couldn't help but notice like a couple of the things so one was like when they were trying to get kira to push harder and harder and harder and for longer um i think uh the problem she was having a problem with just it, it was just probably a lack of clarity like she was pushing with the contractions when the time came and the she was I think she wasn't sustaining her push for quite long enough so it was almost like the baby was like making progress and then going backwards a little bit so the they but they didn't really clarify that it's like a strong push but also it needs to be sustained for the duration of that contraction I think so before you then take your break so um so yeah there was three uh midwives in with us uh, two sorry I should say two and they were both amazing but they were they were um, they were encouraging her to push but then another lady came in who was slightly older and she understands maximum voluntary contraction if she was coaching you through an isokinetic test or uh, just a, an overcoming isometric push or something like that where you're trying to get to 100% your max voluntary contraction. She understands intent. The other ladies were like, come on, push, push, push. And she's like, push, push. She's like screaming. And the energy in the room when she was there was like, I wanted to push. I wanted to push a baby out when she was there. So I was like, that's a good coach. She was a brilliant, brilliant coach, that lady. The others were so good as well, but she just understood like tone of voice and... um and able to change levels with her voice when the time was right and a able to change just 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 to just to not be that little bit robotic with it you know so she was absolutely amazing so that was one thing i noticed was like just 
getting people to push harder. Um, people always have more in them than you think they do or than they think they do. And sometimes, or a lot of the time, it's just the coach's job to get it out a little bit more, uh, to use your tone of voice in the right way. Second one was how much notes they took. They noted everything for the entire time. Uh, the communication between the, each other was so good, um, was so clear. They noted absolutely everything. And I guess that is probably because they are afraid of being sued. Um, they have so much paperwork to do. They have to make sure their eyes are dotted and their T's are crossed. And uh, yeah, so I did notice like that communication that if you're handing over someone, you're so clear. And I know like in our industry, we're often frustrated with the amount of notes that we have to keep, but like they're on, on their side, there's definitely a reason why they're that detail orientated. Um, one is so obviously the patient can be looked after and two is so that you don't get into any, if you, if you do get into any trouble, you are clearly documented what's happened. And then the third one is the power of words. So um, uh, being clear with your words, because at one stage, um, the the pushing was going on quite a while. And one of the nurses started saying, we need to, like, we kind of need to hurry on here because the baby's getting quite tired. And I don't think Kira really, she said that a few times throughout over like a five minute period. And I don't think Kira noticed her saying it that much or didn't read into it as much as I did. But when I heard that, I was quite, it kind of alarmed me a little bit. I was like, what does she mean by that? And I didn't say it, but I like, I was a little bit frightened when she said that. And I just thought about that in, um, in our setting as well as coaches that we can say something like maybe she just meant, maybe she literally just meant like, it's going to get harder for you as you go along. Or maybe she did actually mean that, like, I don't know, is the baby at a little bit of risk here? As uh, does tired, like, I, I mean, I, I took that as, like, tired means it could be a problem if this keeps going on longer and longer. But I don't know if she wasn't clear with it, and that panicked me a little bit. So I just thought that language was uh, so important. And I thought about how many clients we probably have where we say something off the cuff by, yeah, off the cuff to us, but people can pick that up and assign a lot of meaning to that. So that um, that was something. So those are three things like that I noticed. I can't help but notice these things. It's not like I'm an influencer walking across the road like, looking for content to then talk about online where it's oh that that bumblebee landed on my shoulder and that means so I'm attaching some kind of meaning to it I just can't help but see some of this stuff especially in a setting like that because it's so similar also so different to our type of setting so uh for episode 100 we have a little um we have a little code for you guys for um being with us on the podcast so we have a discount code for 20 percent off all of our products all of our programs and our member site as well dgr interactive it doesn't extend to workshops but all our workshops are sold out right now any anyway um so the code is matthew which is our little boy's name m-a-t-t-h-e-w all lowercase so matthew M-A-T-T-H-E-W. That applies to lower body basics, one and two, core basics, upper body basics, our foot, ankle, and Achilles program. And then also the yearly option for DGR Interactive. It doesn't apply to the monthly option for DGR Interactive. Um, so yeah, um, it's been an interesting week or so since he was born. The first couple of nights when we came home were absolutely insane, but I'm too tired to discuss that now maybe i will discuss it another time um but we just got out for our first little walk with him there the sun is shining here and honestly i don't know like every day his eyes open a bit more and they get a bit clearer and it's for a reason like evolution is a fucker it's like he's trying to pull on your heartstrings and and he's trying to he's i don't know it, like babies are just designed to make you love them so that you look after them it's 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 not an accident that they're cute and that they 
cry in a certain way but then when you pick them up they stop crying and then they look at you in a certain way and then they like the way they feed and stuff like jesus christ um they're they're amazing so uh so yeah um it's been a it's been a wild ride so far so this uh, episode for me 100 is dedicated to matthew um he um what I will say is my mom died when I was 16 and I was thinking about recording this podcast today and I just wanted to, um, I wanted to dedicate it to him and what's wild for all of us, our age or whatever age we are listening to the podcast is in the age that we live in, we are all able to, all our kids or our nieces and nephews or whatever are probably going to have videos of all of us as we get older as we pass away and stuff they're going to have videos of us they're going to be able to hear our voices and see us moving and all of this stuff but um my mom would have only been about i think 60 i don't know uh, i didn't look at the, her exact age now but she died when i was 16 which is uh almost 20 years ago like 17 years ago or something now and i don't know what her voice sounded like i can i have no record of uh, i have no video i don't think of her maybe someone somewhere does but i don't have one and i can't remember what she sounds like and that is i would love to know what she sounded like i would love to see a video of her talking just so i could hear her voice i can't remember it so it's wild to me that he could potentially come and listen to me talking at some stage in the future if he wanted to, he probably won't want to, um, but he could come and listen to a hundred hours of his dad talking about stuff. How wild is that? Like you can really get to know someone. Like I'm saying, you can get to know someone in a podcast. You probably learn stuff about, about uh, our kids and younger people can really get to know us even uh, through without maybe being able to get to know some of us or after we pass away or whatever so yeah there's going to be a hundred hours of, of podcasts that he can listen to um so yeah i know that's i don't know maybe that will make some of you guys think about just your own parents or grandparents that maybe you can't maybe you can, i don't know that is that an interesting thing to think about does that does anyone else think about that i cannot remember what my mom sounds like I cannot, if I tried to picture her voice, I can see a picture of her, but I cannot, I do not know what she sounds like. So does, do other people have that problem with people that in their lives have passed away? Um, I don't know. Maybe you have videos, maybe it's like Kira has videos of her dad doing uh, speeches at weddings and stuff like that. Like I have nothing like that from my mom. So yeah, I would have loved, imagine if someone did a podcast with her, recorded a private podcast and asked her about her life for an hour. That would be, I'd pay any amount of money for that. So, um, sorry. So someone asked me in a previous episode about, oh, so the code is Matthew for 20% off. You can use that and, um, yeah, have a little 20% off on Matthew, uh, because we need to buy some nappies for him and some baby grows and stuff. So, um, Okay, so someone asked in a previous one, sorry, I don't have your name again, I should, uh, about my knee journey, and I'm going to run through it quickly enough, and then I'm going to talk about some lessons that I learned from what, some like higher level lessons, not like super obvious lessons, like I should have been stronger type of lessons. So here's, uh, because the the cool thing about, I guess for episode 100, the cool thing about, if anyone is still listening, but the cool thing about this episode uh, is that when I talk about my knee journey, I'm effectively talking about my journey in this industry as well. Some of you will have heard me talk about some of this stuff, but I'm going to um, have some of the lessons that you won't have heard me talk about. So when I was, all the, all my timeline is going to be messed up and not accurate in any way, shape or form. Because I've told this so many times, I don't even know what the timeline is, but I'm, whatever dates I throw out, just know don't try and fact check me. They're not accurate. I'm just saying that now. So I think I was about 21. All my friends went to America for what we call in Ireland a J1. You're, when you're in college, you're able to go for three months and work in 
uh, the States somewhere. All my friends went for three months. I only went for three weeks, like in the middle of the summer, because I was playing a lot of football at the time in Ireland. And I was really starting to make progress at this stage. I had gone to the gym. Um, I had started to go to the gym regularly enough when I was, when I was, uh, I, don't, I don't know, at a certain age, I was struggling quite a bit physically. I was big and strong, but it just was slow. And um, I, I went to the gym, I got an SNC coach that um, was kind of a friend of the family, an amazing SNC coach who's still around, he lectured in the college for a long time. He wrote me like a super basic program. People, on, on, funny thing is, online coaches now would laugh at this program and say like, that's not a good program, but it actually transformed me physically, which just shows when you're a newbie, like anything will work. And um, it worked so incredibly well for me. And I was making unbelievable progress. I went from like one of the slowest people on the team to one of the fastest people on the team in four months, less actually, in probably three months. And that's not an exaggeration. I literally remember uh, I was playing with a guy. I had been playing with a guy for four years on like uh, inter-county teams up through like under 16, 18, under 21. And then we were both uh, training together after this kind of stint in the gym and we were just doing some like 15 meter sprints just after the warm-up as part of the team and I was absolutely blowing past him and he was he was in awe he was like what the fuck have you been doing um and I could literally feel my feel how much faster I was moving so um so yeah I was making so much progress I went to America we went to with all the lads a load of young Irish lads drinking having a laugh and we went one day we were in south carolina we went we hired a load of mopeds and went to a shooting range went to the shooting range on the way back to the shooting range back to the dirtiest motel in history we were about three minutes away from the the motel after driving an hour on mopeds to a shooting range on a highway that we weren't supposed to be on and one of the guys in front of me started like (laughs) catcalling girls on the side of the road that were walking in their bikinis and I between him like kind of slowing down in front of me and between me like looking at him um again women are going to hate me listening to this podcast I I had to end up when I look back I had to like swerve out of his way I hit the deck my knee absolutely tore open um so then I spent the following two weeks out there and one one of the girls uh, that was staying in the motel as well was a student nurse from Ireland and she told me that I should go for a swim in the sea every day to keep the wound clean. Uh, she was probably not wrong for the first day, but the problem was the wound wouldn't close. It was seeping for two weeks at a time. I didn't go to the hospital because I didn't have insurance. Um so came back and I had to, when I came back to Ireland, I had to dress up my knees, strap it and all that that stuff because it was, the wound was, every time I fell playing a game, which you only realize how much you end up on your knees playing sport when you actually have an open wound and like it would have the t- thinnest layer of skin on it and then it would open again and the wound was right on my patellar tendon. So this went on for good bit of time eventually it, it the wound closed but I started to notice my quad was wasting away so that impact and then the following protective movement that my nervous system developed just from not wanting to load into it probably not even wanting to load into the tendon probably not wanting to like bend the knee and stretch the skin that started to completely change how I move I developed a really nasty patellar tendinopathy and that basically ran my life for several years, probably seven or eight years. Um, interestingly enough, I have felt a little bit, uh, actually quite a bit of that in my knee again over the past few weeks for the first time in four or five years. And not really to do with an, a massive spike in load. I had a big flare up in my knee one night playing indoor football. Um, it was quite an intense game. And it was on a like the ha- a hardwood floor, and that then flared up again playing tennis, and then again playing tennis again after that. So it was like an acute tendon uh, flare up, but on top of 
what would have already been the patholic like my if, if you imaged my patellar my right patellar tendon the pathology there would be scary <laughs> there would be very little amount of healthy tendon left uh even though like i went without i went i went still like doing a lot of sport and jumping and all of this stuff um without any pain for about five years but that tendon is going to be an absolute mess so funnily enough over the last month probably yeah probably it is probably actually a month i've had three flare-ups in my tendon which is just kind of one continual flare-up of my tendon it also coincided with a time where for the last few months i've been doing a lot of plyos uh just fucking around to be honest uh but more than any of that all of that was absolutely fine but it coincided with like the probably a very very stressful period of time in my life where there was so much stuff going on which you've all heard about so um I during that time then I went to basically like all of these experts uh, around the world uh not around the world in Ireland especially and then I started to dabble around the world to help with my knee and it was really poor it was really poor and eventually you know what the thing that helped me was I went doing uh kind of internal and external Chinese martial arts in Sydney and what helped me was they do stances in those in, in those arts long basically isometric holds in stances like a like a very shallow squat stance they do like a horse stance they do a riding horse rider riding a dragon stance which is like a kind of a cossack squatty type of stance so we were doing like holds four or five minutes at a time and i started to notice that my knee felt really 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 good and i had read in the research a little bit about isometrics or sorry no i'd seen there was research around isometrics and stuff like that but none of that had helped me and it was just because the dosages weren't enough and the stress wasn't enough so five minutes of of holes i was expecting to wake up my knee being bits the next morning and actually i was waking up and my knee was feeling really really good so i hammered that for quite a while um that also probably coincided a little bit with a reduce in the amount of sport that I was playing, like jumping and running. And so it was probably a perfect storm for me actually improving around that time. So here's some lessons that I learned along the way. Um, one is that inhibition is a very, very real thing. I've spoken about this on the podcast if you've had chronic pain for a while there it does change how you move but you can't just presume that uh you're going to give someone an exercise to target a muscle like a bodybuilding exercise and it's going to target and they're and they're going to just get muscle hypertrophy and strength by doing that exercise just just writing an exercise and sets and reps down when you've had a lot of pain your your body will do anything it can to avoid um loading that's not even correct what i'm saying because what it's doing what it was doing for me and so many others is it's actually avoiding loading the quad and it's loading the patellar tendon which is the opposite it's trying to avoid loading the quad my quad is getting smaller my tendons getting uh, um, even more and more sore as i'm doing certain exercises you would think that the body would say no let's actually load the muscle more and offload the joint or the tendon in question but that is not what happens um it's it's not what happens so inhibition is a very real thing and i i think about that quite a lot i also see that with a lot of uh it's hard to measure this obviously but i see that with a lot of chronic lower back clients i think the pilates people are right that their anterior core particularly their deeper anterior core and a lot of these chronic lower back clients i think is i think is quite weak that i'm not saying that there's not high levels of activation there there usually is high levels of activation in terms of like it won't relax it's on all the time but i find that when you when you're sneaky about it and you stress it in a certain way you'll actually see a ton of weakness there an inability to control movement uh in a very a, a massive inability to control movement i see that around the anterior core when there's a lot of lower back and our hip and groin problems um i'm not saying why it's there i think partly it's there because of the nervous system partly it's there then because like they just avoid loading those tissues and so they get weak 
partly i don't know several other things but inhibition is a really real thing and the uh, the difference so often with a chronic lower back person or a chronic knee person or a chronic achilles or a chronic whatever is a bad coach or an okay coach will know what they a bad coach won't have a clue they'll say it's a weak glute and like here's a clam bullshit right and a good coach will have like okay actually your patellar tendon is at you i probably do need to strengthen up your quads and blah 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 but a bad coach will just presume that writing squat like do a back squat three sets of five reps uh three days a week like they're they're uh, they're not a bad coach they're probably a good coach but if it's pretty bad that won't work that well or it might not work that well Whereas a good coach actually understands that the coaching is important. Understands that like you actually need to troubleshoot and there's a good chance that this won't target it in the way that you want. Patellar tendon might not be a great example here because you can usually get a leg extension and, and get that to work. But like for other stuff, joint pain and things like that, uh, or a, a squat is a better example. Like they will just shift the load away from that area in a squat. So you have to be able to constrain them and then you have to help them understand this is how I really want you to perform it. And you have to be super clear about that. So that is number one. Inhibition is a really bit, re- is a very real thing. Um, number two, pain is, is, can be quite depressive um, or depressing. Um, so all the talk, the big thing in the in the in the industry is the BPS model at the moment and for a long time now, but it's been adopted more and more, which is amazing. But if I told a physio that a lot of a lot of physios that I had pain in my patellar tendon and I'm depressed over it, it's causing issues to my life and blah blah blah. There's a good chance they would send me to a psychiatrist, psychologist. There's a good chance they would talk to me and uh spend so much time talking about sleep and nutrition and mindset and stress and all of this stuff which they would be well in their right they would be probably right to do that i would do that with a client as well but guess what got rid of my kind of borderline depression around my knee uh doing some isometrics for my knee (laughs) <laughs> so as soon as my knee felt good i was happy again so the bps model can work in many different ways uh the pain can be there and then all of this other stuff can happen afterwards all of this life stressors and, and things getting worse can happen afterwards or the other way around maybe you're really stressed like i am now like i was recently and then my knee pain started to come it's probably like it, there, there's no right way around this but sometimes i would say a lot of the time we're going really deep into like the the psychosocial side of things when some of the time if you can just give someone the right movements uh, they will feel better and all of the psychosocial things will start to solve themselves because if you feel like shit in your body uh, actually this was a thing in the internal martial arts as well the reason they do such they go so heavy on at a school that I was with they go so heavy on exercise for the first year I don't think they call it exercise they call it forms where like you're literally standing there and you're moving your arms around in a circle for an hour they try and basically make your body really strong and um re- uh, help uh, strip excess tension away from you because and this is not exactly right probably my explanation but because when you actually sit down to meditate or do your mind training they don't want your body constantly screaming at you they want your body to be strong so your mind can focus and i think when you have constantly have a body that's in pain and pulling at you then it's very hard for your mind to focus or for you to be happy so that might mean you need to talk to someone and get all this life stresses and psychosocial stuff or sometimes i'm not saying all the time sometimes you just fucking need to sort out the thing in your body and you'll be happy again okay because i think it is feeling i think it is starting to spill the other way there is no rules for this you just have to look at the person in front of you and say like okay, maybe I need to educate them a bit, probably, usually, maybe I need to talk to them and do all this stuff, yeah, of course, 
I do need to educate them in terms of what's going on. But sometimes the answer is actually, let's get this body sorted and I bet you feel happy. Okay. So that's, that's another one. Uh, another one, I'm kind of rushing here because I actually have a call very, very soon. Um, another one is uh, the coaches that talk about the nervous system knowing best and that uh, just let the body and the system self-organize, uh, that is bullshit. Self-organization is happening all of the time, no matter what. I'm sitting here talking how my jaw moves, my body is self-organizing. Uh, self-organization is happening no matter how much you coach you coach heavily or you don't coach at all they are still self-organizing that is happening you cannot take that away unless you do something where you lock them into uh, some kind of spider-man suit which forces them to move in a certain way self-organization is happening but the type of coaches that talk about the nervous system knowing best like I understand the sentiment, but you're wrong. The nervous system knows how to pick a pattern that it believes is protective and it will stick to that pattern at all costs. We see that again and again and again. That they, It might know best to protect you in the short term, but five years later, that injury is gone, that tissue is healed and you're still moving in a way that's you're limping around you're moving like a fridge you're not rotating there's no relative motion at your spine um the nervous system does not know best it knows how to pick a pattern that it believes is protective to you and it might be protective but it is not serving you it is not doing anything good for you in the long run so the coaches i really think this nervous system knows best coaches like the sentiment is not, it's an okay sentiment, but practically speaking, a lot of the time that is absolute bullshit. Uh, next one. Um, I would say that the evidence, I love where the industry is going in terms of the science and we're trying to come up with better explanations for the things that we do. This is the only way that we move forward. I actually was thinking about this with regards to the hospital as well. I was like, a few uh, a few hundred years ago or a thousand years ago birth giving birth was so much more dangerous for both the baby and for the mother and now it's so much less this is because probably because of amazing practitioners at the cold face who were figuring out uh, the best practices as they went along but the reason that it didn't die with them and that all these practices and all this knowledge can compound up to today and now we have best practices around the world is because of the scientific method. So it usually starts with a great mind who is figuring things out or a number of great minds who figure things out. This is what a lot of coaches online use to kind of uh, try and knock the science side of things it's like the science is years behind great coaches some of the time it is let's be honest a lot of the time I would say it is but that's not a reason to knock the science the science is actually the thing that will help this knowledge compound and keep pushing the industry as a whole forward just because there's one guy over here that's doing an amazing job uh, it's not an excuse to bash the science that will end up as part of the scientific method and that's what elevates the whole industry. So uh, the science is so important, but what I would say is I went to so many at the time with my knee, like quote unquote evidence-based uh, clinics, physios, doctors. They were cutting edge research at the time. They were on the edge. Actually, one clinic in particular was contributing a lot of research and still is contributing a lot of amazing research to the industry. But the experience that I had there was absolutely terrible. I had I received some of the worst coaching. When I look back, I spent one session with a with a physio. He spent half an hour, maybe an hour, trying to coach me to do a front squat without with a ver with a vertical shin. He, he was adamant that I could not let my knee go forward over my ankle to do a front squat. Like, you don't understand physics, my friend. That, that is impossible. But I didn't say that at the time. I fucking stood there and he had a stick 
and he base a, and and every single time I tried to squat down, he was like, "No, back up. You moved your knee forward a millimeter." That is, and this is that that was the level of coaching I received at the time. That is just one example. There was many examples. That is just one example. So, for the coaches and therapists that are putting evidence based physio, evidence based practitioner in your Instagram account on your tagline. I just want to say to you, you take it or leave it now. It doesn't, it, it, like, if, if you feel like that helps you, great. In my mind, putting a tagline, evidence-based physio or evidence-based coach, it means nothing with regards to how good, excuse me, how good a coach you are. It also means absolutely nothing to the clients that you're trying to attract. Unless you're attracting, trying to attract clients that are incredibly well informed, what you're doing, probably, if you're being honest with yourself, when you put that on your tagline or in your bio, is you're trying to impress other coaches and therapists, which is absolutely fine uh, as long as you know that. But as, and as long as maybe you're trying to attract them as your clients. If you're not, then evidence based, putting that tagline literally means nothing. Because you could be evidence-based and still absolutely dog shit. It doesn't mean anything. I'm not saying don't be evidence-based. I consider myself very much evidence-based. I just don't see the benefit in in needing to advertise evidence-based because there could be a whole lot of evidence-based. There is a whole lot of evidence-based physios and coaches out there that are dog shit. And it means nothing to your clients. So evidence-based in terms of as an individual practitioner and claiming you are that, it means nothing. It is irrelevant to claim that because anyone can claim that about anything. It does not mean you are good. The final one of the lessons, um, and I just scribbled these out before the podcast. So ask me another day, there'll probably be all different lessons. Actually, bear with me one sec. I'm going to write to my client and tell him I'm going to be a few minutes late. Hang on. One sec, guys. Okay. Uh, there we go. Okay. Last one of these is the... I've learned not to be hard on people. When I use that example of that, uh, of of some of the treatment that I received over the years, uh, I, I, I didn't help, no, I won't say I held grudges. I just was frustrated for a long time with the care that I received because I look back, I look at a client now who went through some of the issues and I'm like, Jesus, in six weeks I could make, I, if, if I, if myself back then came to myself now for help. I could make so much improvements in three weeks, six weeks. I could save your whole, the whole career. I could take you out of that depressive state so quickly just by talking to you and giving you a few simple exercises and helping you understand what's going on. And that frustrated me for a long time, but it doesn't anymore. I've learned not to be hard on people. And I've just learned that pe- mostly people are trying their best and... Uh, in 10 years time, I'll probably look at myself now and say, Jesus, what I was doing, what I was doing back then wasn't great. It wasn't good enough. It could have been so much better. So I don't want to look at other people and say how they helped me a few years ago wasn't great and like screw them because of it. No, I don't want to feel like that. And I shouldn't feel like that. And it's wrong to feel like that. They were doing their best, I think, for the most part. Some people weren't, but uh who cares about them but and also now I don't want to be that hard on people right now other coaches or therapists who for the most part they're not doing a good job but they're doing their best hopefully they will also look back or in a few years time hopefully they will have a chance to learn and grow and change and I just think we're all on different parts of our journey and as long as your intention is correct then um I don't want to be hard on you. There is certain people on social media that actually frustrate the life out of me. And it's because I have seen them over several years do the same type of posts, same type of things. And I know what they're doing. And some of them I know, and 
they have not learned they are doing it on purpose what they are doing and i do want to be hard on them but for the most part i think people are trying their best and we're all on different parts of our, our journey and don't be shitting on people uh just because you have had a chance to learn from better mentors sometimes than them you have had a chance to learn from your own mistakes sometimes better than them or learn from i don't know your your own parents taught you uh, in a different way to them to keep an open mind or think differently or something so don't be too hard on people that would be my final lesson so my uh five lessons that i went through there is like inhibition you should really be thinking about that uh especially when it comes to chronic pain Ugh, it's just it's just it's just difficult it's just important to recognize it that it's going to be there a lot of the time and you need to kind of coax the movement back out um, and that can be there because of fear it can be there because of a legacy within the tissue it can be there because of changes in coordination like so many things but it's it, it's often there um so we need to be aware of it um the second one was pain is depressing it changes everything in the bps model like it can sometimes you need to be uh uh like a psychologist type of person with your clients other times you need to be less so or sometimes you just have a body part that's really sore and when that feels good it's not this big massive biopsychosocial okay we need to get into every single thing that ever happened in your life sometimes an isometric helps your knee and now your knee feels better other times not but sometimes that is the case please keep an open mind that bio is still part of biopsychosocial uh and other times keep in mind that the bio is really not that important at all okay um third one the nervous system knows best absolute bullshit uh the nervous system does not know best the nervous system is one stakeholder in this and uh you should it's not a it's not uh you shouldn't view the body as a dictatorship the nervous system knows best the nervous system is the dictator and all of us are just little weaklings that are there to serve what the nervous system thinks no bullshit wrong it is uh I, I don't know it's not a democracy I don't know but the nervous system has a vote but you as a coach also have a vote and your vote is really important and the person's vote is really important the nervous system does know, not know best it knows how to pick a pattern that is it deems as protective it deems as efficient but that doesn't mean it is the best pattern and it's serving that person in the long run uh that was the fourth one third one um fourth one evidence-based means nothing on an individual basis be evidence-based but don't brag about being ev evidence-based to your colleagues or your clients because it is irrelevant you could be evidence-based and absolutely dog shit I, in fact many people are many people aren't but many people are which means that that label means nothing especially when you write it in your social media bio you're only trying to impress your peers you write something that actually means something to your clients that you're trying to attract if that means something to your clients that you're trying to attract great go with that and then the final one i learned not to be too hard on people so those are some of my lessons and um i hope I, I, I really did rush that podcast. I should have fucking, sorry, I shouldn't curse. I should have uh, timed my day better. I also should have gotten more than two hours sleep last night. That would have been helpful. Um, but hopefully this podcast is okay. Don't forget about the code Matthew for 20% off everything. Um, annual membership for DJ Interactive, which is our um, educational site where we have a thousand coaches and therapists i actually put up a really good video the other day uh yesterday i think um gotten great it's like a fly on the wall for me coaching with a chronic back pain client who cannot move his pelvis at all until he can move his pelvis uh a lot so uh, you see like hundreds of videos like that up there um and then you get all the other programs as well 20 percent off um oh i need to crack my back um, so yeah, I'm going to leave it there. I think one kind of parting word of wisdom is 
I am feeling uh, semi-emotional at the moment. I've just been thinking about like my journey to this point. And I never thought I would be the person I am today a few years ago. And when I'm not saying I'm a good or bad or whatever person, just me as a human being, if you asked me a few years ago, five years ago, like to look at the person I am now, I wouldn't have thought I would be that person. And so when you think about uh, yourself and think about the things that you want in life, often we think like, I can't, I don't know how to do that. I, I'm not, I wouldn't be able to do that. Uh, when you think of like, I, oh, trying to build a business or trying to help a certain amount of clients in a certain way or trying to start a family or trying to do whatever it is in life, whatever your goal is, whatever your wants are. I couldn't do that. I'm I'm not X enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not uh, disciplined enough or whatever. You're right. You're not. You're not, but your future future self is. That's the funny thing. That's the weird thing to get your head around. You're you're not. You actually you're right. You're not good enough to do that, but your future self is good enough to do that. And that's not like a wacko psychology type of thing. The only thing that you need to do currently is you, you just need to make a decision to try to. I know not to try to do it. To do it. And that is what sets you in motion in becoming the type of person that I guess can do that. So that's a weird thing that I'm kind of trying to think about or leave you with. But like five years ago, you asked me, could you do 100 episodes of a podcast? No. Could you build a business in the size that you've built it? No. Could you teach workshops all over the world? No. Could you be a better person that has more empathy for people? no <laughs> uh could you i don't know be friends and have co deeper conversations with people no could you help all these people could you i don't know could you raise a fucking child no i don't think so not in a way that wouldn't be like me just being selfish or something like that so yeah the most powerful thing in the world is actually just making a choice to actually go after something that is, you don't need to be the person that can do it you just need to make a choice that you're actually going to go after it and then you will become that person along the way I guess that's I think that's the big lesson that I have learned um and you don't yeah you don't need to be that person in fact you aren't that person but you will become that person you just need to make a choice not a choice to try like oh I'm gonna see if I can do this or try and do this you can't do it you can't do it. So don't try and don't see and don't whatever. Just make a choice to do it. And that is what helps you become that person along the way. So that is episode 100. I hope that is was good for you guys. Um, please, again, I'm getting loads of comments on YouTube. So please drop a comment there. Give me some feedback. If any of those lessons were applicable to you, let me know. And um, yeah, uh, lots of love. Talk to you guys next time.